Well, last Monday was the Queen's birthday. And as it happens every year on the Queen's birthday, uh, honors are handed out to various Aussies for their contribution to the country and their service to the community. So in these latest rounds of honors, the top one, which is called the Companion of the Order of Australia, well, was just given to three people. Uh, two of them were businesswomen who had done lots of good for the community, for charities. But of course, the most notable top honor went, and the one that got quite a lot of backlash and was a bit controversial, uh, went to our former Prime Minister, uh, Tony Abbott. Now, I'm sure even among us, there are mixed feelings about that one, yeah? But in total, 933 honours were handed out, and that included uh, former Australian cricket captain Michael Clark, uh, former Senators uh, Bronwyn Bishop, uh, Premier Mike Baird, and uh, the Barefoot Investor, if you guys know a guy called Scott Pape. Now, these honours are quite a big deal, aren't they? I mean, in the UK, those top honours uh, would be something like a knighthood. You'd be, get to be called sir or ma'am. And got me thinking, though, if there was a Christian equivalent of Queen's Birthday Honours, well, who do you think should get honoured? Right, who, who would make the top list? Who would make the second list? I wonder if you've ever thought about that. Now, I reckon that the Corinthian church in ancient Greece would have loved the idea of a Christian Honours list. I mean, they were into all that kind of stuff, right? Celebrity Christian culture, praising, comparing Christian leaders from all around the place. Perhaps not that different to our Christian culture right now in the West. Uh, one thing, though, would have been certain. The Apostle Paul would not have made any of their lists. Yeah, his life, his ministry, the way he carried himself, the way he spoke, he was not their idea of success at all. And I suspect by many of our standards today, even in Christian circles, Paul probably wouldn't have made our list either. But you know what? They don't count, do they? I mean, it really does not matter what we think of each other because at the end of the day, it's what God thinks that's important. And Paul would have made God's list of honors because by God's standard of measurement, what he commends, what he honors, well, it's just so very different to ours. And it's here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 13 that we see why. Now, why is that important for us? Well, here it is. If you are a follower of Jesus, then as Paul says in chapter 5, verse 9 of 2 Corinthians, he said it this. He says, we make it our goal to please him. Yeah, we make it our goal to please him. So if you love Jesus and you want to please him, then, then you should want to know what he loves to see in his people and what he loves to see in those who serve him. And as I said last week, well, we should want to be faithful in all things, right? Faithful. And hearing God say to us at the end of our lives, well done, good and faithful servant. That really should motivate us, shouldn't it? So, do you want to know what God commends and what God honors in his followers? If so, this passage is tremendously important. So let me pray. Pray with me and then we'll get into the guts of it. Father God, please help us today to understand how it is and what it is that brings a delight to your face when it comes to our lives and the way that we want to serve you and love you. So change us, Holy Spirit, so that we might be able to carry through what we learn in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we get into the guts of the passage, uh, just a little bit of the story so far, a bit of the context. So two weeks ago when we left 2 Corinthians, we were in chapter 5 when Paul, remember, he said that he and actually all those who carry God's precious good news to others are Christ's ambassadors, right? We represent Jesus, our King, like an ambassador. and We bring an important message. What's the message? Well, be reconciled to God. You remember that? Be reconciled to God. Now, that idea continues straight into chapter 6, the first part of the, the passage we read. Paul, remember, says there in verses 1 and 2 that we are God's co-workers and we are calling on people to be saved while it is still the day of salvation. All right? Jesus died for us in our place on the cross. He rose again from the dead three days later to offer new life. And this good news, which is good news, it's, it's great news, isn't it? It is for you, no matter what race, what age, what gender, what background. And that news, says Paul, is for now. 
Right? People right now can be saved, can have forgiveness, reconciliation with their Creator, and eternal life. And we can have it all before we face God in judgment. So this is the message. So listen to it. Listen to its messengers. Accept it. Receive it. That's what Paul is saying. Now, by the way, that includes you. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you can accept this message. So please connect with us. We would love to help you find out more about Jesus and how he does hold the key to your life and death and eternity. All right, so you would think that given Paul's role as an ambassador of Christ, as God's co-worker, as Jesus' special messenger, that's actually what the word apostle means, right? His special sent messenger. You would think that given all that, that he would be honored, wouldn't he? Honored by the Corinthian Christians. Well, no, quite the opposite. I mean, this whole letter to Corinthians is in many ways a defense by Paul. It's kind of sad that he has to even defend himself and his life and his ministry to the very people he helped to... To bring to know Jesus. I mean, he planted this church. But they looked down on Paul. They thought very little of him. They looked at him. And then they looked around them at all the impressive leaders and celebrities, both inside the church and outside the church. And they thought that Paul was really quite pathetic in comparison. And so Paul, in this letter, is defending himself to them. And and he really doesn't get more impassioned uh, here than, than here in these verses, yeah? Uh, you see it there, don't you? At the end of the passage we read, verses 11 to 13, 11 to 13, Paul is saying, open up your hearts to me because that's what I'm doing for you. I'm opening up. I'm becoming vulnerable to you. So please enlarge your hearts. Open it up to me. And so we come to the bit I'm actually going to spend the rest of our time on today, which is verses 3 to 10, because here we see 28 descriptions full of emotion, full of passion as to why Paul says, Well, my life and my ministry, as far as God's concerned, is commendable. Now, the idea of um, being commended in verse 4, right? Being commended in verse 4, that idea is is the same as the one behind the Queen's birthday honors. That's why I mentioned at the beginning. Um, Those who are commended are those who are recognized, those who are honored for their good work. Now, Paul was not commended by the Corinthians, but he says here, look at 28 reasons why God would have commended him. Now, I've divided these 28 reasons into three subgroups, three points. They all start with P, right? Persecution, purity, paradox. Easy to remember. Persecution, purity, paradox. But actually, you know what? They all come under the bigger theme and heading of endurance. Okay, endurance. You see, verse 4 begins. Verse 4 says, As servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance... And then the list goes on. Now, there are good reasons to believe that great endurance is the overall heading that the other 27 descriptions sort of flesh out, right? So what this is saying is that God commends, God honors those who endure. Those who keep going when the going gets tough. Those who run the marathon and not the sprint. Those who fall but then pick themselves up and keep going. Those with grit those with determination, those who stick it out no matter what for a lifetime. Endurance is what God commends. Endurance, great endurance, is what God honors. Those of us who are young in age, or relatively, and young in faith especially, remember it's not how you begin that matters, it's how you finish. So for Paul and his great endurance, it's seen in three ways, all right? As I said, three points. Three groups of reasons um, for uh, uh, three groups of reasons or three groups of descriptions. And here Paul goes into why he is to be commended for his endurance. Firstly, persecution. Persecution, my first point. The kind of life that God commends and honors is the one that endures through heaps and heaps of hardships, particularly for being a Christian. So let's read again from verse four. Follow with me on the screen. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, in hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger. All right, the first three there, troubles, hardship and distresses, they describe general troubles, general troubles. Um, If you look at other English translations, you'll see that these three words are translated in other ways, uh, such as afflictions or difficulties, 
or calamities. Uh, you put it all together, you get the picture. Paul's life was not an easy life at all, was it? I mean, these are just general troubles. But I suspect that neither are your lives, my life. If we live long enough, we will face general troubles in life, even if not specifically from persecution. We all experience a variety of general hardships, don't we? And I know a lot of you specifically are going through some really tough times at the moment. But Paul says he endured through all of them. He kept going. And the next three, the next three, beatings, imprisonments, and riots, well, they're more specific troubles that come from persecution for being a Christian or a messenger of Jesus. Um, in chapter 11, Paul will describe how he received a near-fatal whipping from the Jews. Not just once, not twice, but five times. And then he was beaten with rods three times. As for imprisonment, Paul wrote half of his letters in jail. As for riots, the book of Acts records at least seven cities in which Paul, uh, because of his preaching of the gospel, uh, the city went up in riots. And yet, he endured. And finally, the last three in this group, hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. Well, they're troubles that sort of come from himself and the way that he worked. I mean, the way that he toiled, the way that he cared, the way he would neglect himself even for the sake of others. Now you put all nine descriptions together and you get a snapshot of the life of the Apostle Paul. And yet he endured. And that's the kind of thing that God commends. Now, there's a danger here as we look at this list, isn't there? I mean, it's easy to think, well, that's inspiring, but it's just well, too, too extreme to apply to me. I don't expect to be beaten with rods or causing riots in my city. So does that mean there's nothing here for me? Does it mean that as a follower of Jesus, there's nothing that God would commend in me? Well, I want to suggest that while the specifics with Paul and us might be quite different, the core challenge should be the same. Because here's the thing, the challenge of the life that God commends, the, the life that described here is the challenge of a life that's willing to give up that most precious modern idol. And what's the idol? What are we to give up? It's comfort, right? It's comfort. That is the most precious modern idol, isn't it? Comfort and pleasure. And that is supremely relevant to us, is it not? So here's the thing. You cannot be a follower of Jesus. You can't be committed to his cause. You can't to be, seek to be commended by Jesus. If you hold on to comfort as a right, as an entitlement. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong in and of itself with comfort or privilege and wealth and pleasure. I mean, all these things, the Bible says, are good gifts from God. The problem, as you know, though, is when good things become God things, yeah? When they actually take pride of place in our lives, when having them become something that we can never give up. That's an idol. And in the wealth and the privilege that is in most of our lives, comfort is one of those idols that we struggle the most with, right? Now, you're going to see it in big ways. I see it in big ways in my life. Like if I'm unwilling, when I'm unwilling to be radically generous with my money or when I'm unwilling to go where God calls me to go in spite of the cost. And they may be the things you're struggling with right now. God has said to you, do this, go there, give up. And you're like, mm, I can't. It's too much comfort to leave behind. The big things. But I see it even more so. And for most of you, it's going to be the little things every single day. So what are some of these things? Well, it's when loving someone means really going out of your way and sacrificing for them. When, when, when I lose my temper at my kids because they've interrupted my peace and quiet and my, my time. Or when I think... I'm entitled by my hard work to put my feet up and be served by others for a change rather than having to serve them. Or when I become angry and disappointed when my hopes for a better future, a better house, a better car, a more comfortable life is threatened for some reason because of maybe because of the pandemic. I'm a slave to comfort and chances are so are you. And it's here that God speaks right into our lives, right? Because you don't have to be beaten with rods and chucked in prison to get radical. You just have to lay down your right to be comfortable at the feet of the cross and be willing to give it up and serve and follow Jesus. 
Now, some of you are going to be listening and thinking, well, that is just too much to ask. Too much to ask, to, to give up these comforts. Is it, don't I have a right to it? Don't I? Well, here's the thing. If, you're, if you say you're a follower of Jesus, what do you actually think it meant when you decided to follow Jesus? Because who, who are we following? Who are we following? We're, the poor son of a carpenter who never owned a home who barely had a place to sleep, who was crucified at the age of 33, and he said that those who follow him would have great troubles in this life. He says that, John 16, 33, if you want to look it up, right? That's what Jesus says. That's what he was like. That's what it means to follow him. And so those who promise otherwise, like those who preach uh, what's called a prosperity gospel, follow Jesus and he will make you rich and wealthy and healthy. Well, they are preaching lies, aren't they? If you haven't seen it already, go watch the Netflix documentary, all right? Go watch the Netflix documentary, American Gospel, Christ Alone. These guys, they preach it. Do not believe it. Do not believe it for a moment because the gospel that feeds into my idolatry of comfort is really no gospel at all. It's just the false gospel of materialism dressed up with a bit of Jesus. No, the real gospel, the real Christian life, the one that Jesus will commend and honor is one that will endure in persecution and hardship as we surrender our comforts in service of Him. You got that? Well, that's my first point. The first group of descriptions, number two, purity. Purity. Look at verse six. He goes on in the list. In purity, understanding, patience, and kindness. In the Holy Spirit and in sincere love in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. You see, it's so important to remember, isn't it, that the life that God commends and honors is not the one that's really impressive on the outside, but is morally bankrupt on the inside. And God really cares. He really cares about the purity of our lives. God hates hypocrisy, probably above all else. He hates hypocrisy. That's actually the word, by the way, used in verse 6 uh, when it described love. Sincere love in the Greek is literally unhypocritical love. And that ought to describe not just our love, but our whole lives. Now, while all of these are character traits, you look a little closer and you'll see that Paul is especially highlighting these ones in his life because they really characterize his ministry to others, right? That's what he's like as he relates to others, as he leads and teaches and loves others. These are especially other person-directed descriptions, aren't they? Paul is pure and understanding. He's patient, kind, sincere, and loving and truthful, particularly in the way that he treats others, that he, the way he leads them, uh, which means he's not harsh, he's not domineering, he's definitely not a bully, yeah? And he can be like this because he, unlike so many of the leaders of, our, of his day, as well as the leaders of our day, now he, Paul relies completely on God. He doesn't rely on himself in the way that he influences and leads others. So there's the other things in the list that stand out, right? What, what, what does he characterize his ministry? It's in the Holy Spirit, verse 6. It's in the power of God, verse 7. It's with righteousness and integrity, verse 7 as well. And it's here that I think another precious idol of ours is challenged, yeah? I mean, just have a think. When are we tempted to be the opposite of how Paul describes his leadership and his ministry to others or the way he relates to others? When are we tempted to be the opposite of that? When have you been tempted to use power or influence to dominate, to manipulate, or to control others? When has your frustration at people's slowness or inability to change made you angry or resentful? Or just give up in despair? Or resort to popular and yet shallow ways to try and move people and drag them to do what you want them to do? Now, I don't just mean those of you who have felt this in the context of leadership and church ministry, because you know what? It happens in the home. If you're a parent with kids, right? Or maybe you're an adult child with with your parents, or with your siblings. It happens in the workplace, all over the place, right? It happens when you're trying to share the gospel with, with people. I think in, 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 in many ways, for all of us. 
See, I know I'm the opposite to Paul when I, in my pride as a pastor especially, think that it's up to me to change people. I think that it's my leadership, my authority, my gifts, my talents. Well, that's the key thing that people need to change or grow or to move from point A to point B. But you see, the kind of ministry that God commends and honors is not, not one that relies on self. It's not prideful. It's one that actually lets go of the idol, right? The idol of what? Control. And understands that all the power to change comes from God working in people's hearts by His Holy Spirit. It's God's power. It's actually what we looked at in chapters 3 and 4, you remember. And if I get that, then this list of Paul should make much more sense to me, right? If I get that and I learn to let go of my idol of control, well, then I can be pure and understanding. I can really be patient and kind and loving and truthful. I don't have to resort to control to get or get upset or impatient when people fail to change, do you see? Instead, I will serve and lead others by Christ-like example, which means I'll be committed to prayer, which means I'll be reliant on the Holy Spirit and His power, which means I will win people over with integrity and righteousness and humility rather than coercion. Now, those of you in leadership, whether in the church or in the home or even in the workplace, I know you want to do a good job. I know you feel like I do the the privilege and the responsibility, the weightiness of leading others. But you know, God cares about how you lead, not just whether you get the results you want. And he wants us to lean into his power to change, not our ability to control. I got to let go of that idol. Finally, my third point, paradox. The last set of descriptions. Let's look again, starting in verse 8. Through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Well, you probably noticed a pretty clear pattern there, isn't it, with this list with this group of uh, descriptions each one is paired with another and the other that it's paired with is pretty much the opposite isn't it now if you just take one side of each pair this is what you'll get let me let me do it for you let me read it out for you this is what you'd get dishonor bad report regarded as imposters unknown dying beaten sorrowful poor having nothing Now, how many of you would like that on your CVs or your LinkedIn profiles, yeah? (laughs) Because it's a pretty pathetic list, isn't it? It's the kind of list, actually, that the Corinthians would have pinned on Paul. See, taken on their own, it is a bit of a sad and sorry list. But taken with the pair, with their opposites, all of a sudden you get the power of paradox, don't you? Now, you know what a paradox is? A paradox is when you have two seemingly opposite things that may not make much sense when you take them separately, but when taken together, it actually speaks a really powerful truth. So, for example, the only constant is change. Or or the only certainty is uncertainty. Or failure leads to success. They're all paradoxes that together speak a powerful truth. Uh, Durian is a paradox. (laughs) Durian is a paradox. Smells like hell, but tastes like heaven. It's so true. And Paul here lists a bunch of paradoxes that are true in his life. Yeah, I mean, in verse 8, in being dishonored by so many, yet he lives out a glorious and God-honoring life, which is just like Jesus, yeah? And even as he's slandered by others, he is praised by God. So verse 8, bad report and good report, treated as impostors and yet true. And in verse 9, another paradox, as known and yet unknown. Now, I'll pause here for a moment. Have you noticed that how all of these first three have to do with Paul's reputation, right? How, how others see Paul. And so here I reckon another one of our big idols may be exposed. What's that idol? It's the idol of approval. Approval, the, the idol that makes us care so much about being spoken well and thought well by others. Now, if that's you, and let me admit, it is me, 
If that's you, then we, we need to really take a look at this list, right? Because the, the life commended by God is one that needs to let go of this idol, the, the, the idol of people's approval. We've got to be content to perform to an audience of just one. So let me ask you, where in your life do you care much more about what others think of you than what God thinks of you? And where does that show up in your life? Perhaps it's in your unwillingness to speak about Jesus or be counted as a follower of Jesus. Perhaps it's the way that you go along with the crowd, peer pressure, because you fear being left out. Or maybe it's your fear of, well, not saying the loving but hard truths that actually need to be said to someone because, well, you don't want to lose their approval. You don't want to offend them. Let's keep going. Um, Second half of verse 9. As dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed. These are life and death paradoxes, but it's right there in chapter, back in chapter 4, verse 10, when Paul said, We always carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. Uh, Verse 10, keep going. Sorrowful and yet always rejoicing. Here's the real paradox of the Christian life, that actually in the midst of sometimes the deepest sorrows and the deepest hardships, right? Remember, the Christian life is not supposed to be easy, but there is real joy, real joy that cannot be explained, real joy that nothing else in this world can bring, right? That's the Christian life. That paradox. Ah, The last few. Poor yet making many rich, having nothing yet possessing everything. Now, Paul and Jesus both lived lives of such poverty, and yet they were enviably rich in all the ways that counted, yeah? Now, all of those are paradoxes. And so here's the thing. If you're a Christian and you want to live a life that's truly fulfilling and God-honoring, one that will be commended by Him, you better be comfortable with paradox. Now, Martin Luther, Martin Luther, the 16th century father of the Protestant Reformation, he spoke he wrote about two types of theologians, or if you like, two types of preachers or leaders. One is false and one is true. The false one he calls the theologian of glory, right? They're the ones who say that how the world sees life is exactly the same as how God sees life. So in the world, strength is seen through power and control. Wealth is seen through the accumulation of things. Greatness and glory is seen in celebrity culture. Right, what's true in the world must be true in the Christian life according to these theologians of glory. Now, he was talking back then about um, the Roman Catholic Church that he protested against. And, but I fear that much of our Christianity today, in Protestant Christianity, evangelical Christianity, is a lot like that too, isn't it? But the true theologian, he says, is the theologian of the cross. Now, the theologian of the cross is one that sees life through paradox. Because the cross of Jesus is paradox. God is actually revealed in opposites, especially opposite to what the world thinks. So in the cross, that instrument of torture and weakness and shame is paradoxically the place of love and power and glory. Because there God destroys sin, conquers hell, pours out his love. Yeah, And so the true theologian, the true Christian is one who sees life cross-shaped, right? One who embraces paradox. Or in the words of our Bible talk series here on 2 Corinthians, it's someone who understands what? The strength of weakness. That's a paradox. The strength of weakness. My friends, I know that some of you listening here are really, really struggling big time in your lives right at this moment. Please remember that God can be experienced in that struggle even more than you can possibly imagine. That his power really is made perfect in your weakness. So will you keep coming to him? You see, your struggles are not some sort of inconvenient detour on the path to glory. Your struggles are the path to glory and growth. Because there's a paradox. And so putting all 28 descriptions together, the kind of life and ministry that's commended by God and honored by God is the kind of life that endures. Remember great endurance? Firstly, through persecution, that endures with purity, and that endures in paradox. Is that the life that you want? Let me finish with a true story. 
Many years ago, my parents were living and working in Hong Kong. Uh, they attended a church pastored by the great, great grandson of James Hudson Taylor. Now you remember, I spoke about Hudson Taylor a couple of weeks ago, who is the pioneer missionary to inland China, the founder of the world's largest missionary organization, OMF. Now, the father of their pastor was also called James Hudson Taylor, James Hudson Taylor III. Now, he's now passed away, but my parents had the opportunity to hear him speak and to speak to him. And he shared with them his memories of being a young boy in a Japanese labor camp in China towards the end of World War II. And there he shared how he and many other kids in the labor camp were especially cared for and loved by uh, another missionary, an an older, he's only middle-aged, but an older to them missionary, who was also there imprisoned by the Japanese during the war. And this guy was like a father figure to them, uh, to the kids, especially at a time when there were many of them separated from their families and there was real fear and, you know, he loved them, he cared for them. Uh, They remember him fondly and called him Uncle Eric. Uncle Eric. But we would know him as Eric Liddell. Eric Liddell. Now that name might ring a bell to some of you. Maybe you've seen the movie Chariots of Fire. Or maybe you've read about Eric Liddell or heard about him, otherwise known as the Flying Scotsman. You see, Eric Liddell, as a young man, was an Olympic champion. But he was an Olympic champion through... A huge controversy. You see, in 1924, in the Paris Olympics, he was supposed to compete in the 100 meters sprint, and he was his country's best chance at a gold medal. But you see, they scheduled that race to take place on a Sunday. And being a Christian with convictions about the Sabbath, whether you agree with it or not, is not the point. But he had convictions about the Sabbath, and he refused to race on the Sunday. And so he didn't race, right? And someone else won his event instead. Now, you can imagine his teammates, his whole country, the press, right, just flew into a rage at him. The criticisms were just flying and he was obviously in turmoil at his decision. It wasn't an easy decision to be called a national traitor, right? But for Eric Liddell, his reputation and people's approval did not matter as much as his conscience and his conviction before God. So he didn't compete in the 100 meters. Instead, he competed in the 200 and 400 meters. Uh, These are two distances he did not specialize in. He wasn't intending to compete in. He didn't train for it. If you know anything about um, running and distances, 100, 200, 300 meters difference is huge in these events because it's totally different kind of training involved. But surprisingly, he got a bronze in the 200 meters and he ended up winning gold in the 400 meters. And all of a sudden, he was the darling of the press and his team and his nation again. He was a hero. For that, he was commended, honored by everyone, right? Christians and non-Christians. If you saw the movie Chariots of Fire, that's where the story ends. But that's not the end of the story for the real Eric Liddell, because after China, he, uh, sorry, after the Olympics in Paris, he actually went to China, right? He went back to China to do missionary work. He was actually born in China. Pa- uh, his parents were missionaries. And so he went back to China. He spends the next 20 years there, unknown to the rest of the world, serving and loving the unreached in China. And so that's how in 1945, he ended up in a Japanese prison camp with James Hudson Taylor III. And that's actually where he died. Now, only months before the end of the war, months before the liberation of the camp, Eric Liddell died in the camp of a brain tumor. He was only my age, 43. But you see, there was more to this story. Only years later, it was revealed that Prime Minister Winston Churchill had actually arranged to get Eric Liddell out. He arranged with the Japanese for a prisoner exchange, a prisoner swap. And it was there for Eric to take. But instead of taking him for himself, do you know what he did? He gave it up for a fellow prisoner. And so he stayed in the camp. That's meant that he not only missed out on freedom, but he he perhaps missed out on a chance to have his brain tumor treated and operated on. He could have gone home and lived longer. Instead, he stayed and died there. You know, the last recorded words of Eric Liddell are these. It is complete surrender. It is complete 
surrender. You see, what should Eric Liddell be commended for? In the eyes of the world and his peers, it's his Olympic gold in 1924. But in the eyes of God, it's his complete and total surrender. He'll be commended for enduring hardship and persecution. For being willing to give up even his own comfort, even his own life for the sake of others. He'll be commended for the integrity of his life. His commitment to honor God, even if it meant losing the approval of others. The challenge of Eric Liddell's life, well, it's the same as the challenge of the Apostle Paul's here in 2 Corinthians 6, isn't it? And the challenge that God is giving us today is this. Do we desire, do you desire above all else to live a life that will be commended and honored by your Savior? Is that your one driving motivation to be honored and commended by him because he is your savior who died for you and loves you? Will you make your life one of total surrender regardless of the cost? Because that's the kind of life that he'll commend. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we long to lead lives that are commended, honored by you. And so we want to pray that whatever idols stand in the way of that total surrender, you will now expose and you will uproot by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in your homes, your families, your discussion groups, why don't you have a think about this question? I think about the idols that you might need to let go of so that you can live the kind of life that God commends here in 2 Corinthians 6. What kind of idols? I've spoken about a few of them. What idols in your life do you need to let go of that's preventing you from living the kind of life that God commends? All right, thanks, and we'll see you again very soon. Bye.